session itself is the idea is that it's very fluid and conversational so that rather than formal presentations just to make sure that everybody's happy with that and I think Heather's going to settle us to begin <laughs> well yeah we were talking with other liaisons about ways of thinking of this how to make the sessions um kind of get settled into and I, I've been listening to different podcasts by Adrian Marie Brown and different activists about thinking about being grounded in this time right now with complete global upheaval and stress so um yeah I was thinking like before we get into our discussion about the role of art and our research and our teaching and community economies I guess if everyone wants to just take a big breath and just settle in and close their eyes and then just think about what they're where they're sitting And then underneath where you're sitting, just thinking of all the roots and tendrils and all the ways we're connected to a larger ecosystem and something way bigger than our individual selves. And to think of the growth and the regeneration that's always happening all around us. So, and how we can draw from that in the work that we do and how we approach each day in our projects so but just yeah thinking about how to bring in radical abundance it seems so much of what's happening is scarcity thinking and really fight or flight ways of being but how to think of larger abundance so We have the larger energies that are all around us and between us, and we're meeting globally online. So yeah, deep, deep breaths. And how can we bring that, that spirit and that movement forward? So if we want to start, um, and like I said, it would be really great to, if for any reason you have stream of consciousness thoughts or notes or these ideas that you might go for a walk later. If something comes up, please email me um, because we want to have a living archive of how we're thinking about these things. And I know I I think of things later on or yeah, any kind of other queries or quandaries or questions. So please feel free to send them. But yeah, I keep thinking of this kind of work as we're creating little rhizomatic little roots and little critters of ideas moving around the community economies research. And it's a collective project and we keep doing it through meeting like this and through practicing with each other. So if we can keep that spirit moving through this workshop too, or panel. Cool. Thanks, Heather. Oh. And then it would also be good to um, just do a quick round of introductions to everybody sure um avi jump in if you want to add anything but i think if people could just um i think we can see everybody's names on the screen but you could just say where you are and we're thinking about today's session heather suggested like the metaphor of a kind of soup that we might stir some things into and see what it turns see what see what it turns into um a bit like the stone soup story if anyone knows that so if everyone could say where they are in the world and what it is you want to put into the soup of the session um so i'll start so i'm i'm in um, no, tamaki makoto in auckland in new zealand and i am going to put in i think a big dose of sunshine that sounds a bit cliche but it's been very rainy here so i think real some light really bright light and i'll pass to um jenny Thank you. Did I, can you hear me? 
Yeah, sorry. I'm I, as I said to a few of the people earlier. I've been banished to the outdoors because there's a flute lesson going on inside. So I'm sort of fighting the glare of the screen. Um, but I am in the South Island, Te Waipanamu of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, and I don't know. Oh gosh, I don't know. What am I going to put into the suit? I don't know. I'm going to put an I don't know. Um, um, you know, I'm I'm open to I'm open to every I don't know, so I'm open to everything into the soup. <laughs> and I will pass to Anissa. Oh, there we go. Um, good, yeah, again, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. I'm in um, eastern suburbs of Sydney, uh, Bidjigal country, Australia, um, where I've been living for the last six years, not from here originally, but roots that go to England, um, Ireland, East Africa, India. So, yeah, a bit of a I don't know, there's this term rooted cosmopolitan. I don't know, it sounds a bit fancy, but <laughs> I like to think that I'm not just like a rootless, you know, um, <laughs> person floating around, but that I'm connected to all of these places and cultures through my ancestries um, and connections to those, those lands. Um, yeah, and I feel very grateful to be here with you all. Um, I've participated in, I guess it was, what is it 2020? Well, we did a beautiful session where we we did a creative sort of session where we put down our connections to community and we did like a collaborative. Yeah, it was so great. I just have good feelings about that session. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what the dog is barking at, sorry. Um, putting into the soup. Yeah, just uh, I think just um, my heart is really um, like tender right now. Just feeling into lots of things that are going on. And um, yeah, just I'm putting a tender heart into the soup. And I'll pass to um, Aviv. I am here in Hull, um, in eastern Yorkshire, north of England, um, where it's a dark and windy autumn day, I think, night, something like that. Um, and I'll put into the soup something really spicy, something uh, like to the point of pain, as an Israeli friend of mine once said if it didn't hurt how did you how do you know that you've eaten uh so um something painful into the soup and uh i'll pass to justin okay can you hear me hey i'm having to do this finagling i had this last meeting where like my Bluetooth isn't talking to my computer, so I'm using my phone. I, I, so there's no feedback and you can hear me. So that's all that matters. <laughs> um, so hi, my name is Justin. I am currently in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, so I, I'm a visiting scholar at the Ostrom Workshop uh, currently. Um, we're looking at uh, commons making. So how we, we actually use all the stuff we know about commons literature to actually help communities make commons. Um, and uh, well, I know I, when I'm going to put energy, part of why I'm in this cafe, not where I plan to be at home, is bike energy. I've had a lot of extra bicycling today, but I love biking. I even had to bike in the snow yesterday at night, <laughs> and I'm here. Um, so I love the freedom, um, and there is that something still very kind of strangely countercultural about biking, no matter where you are. So uh, whatever that connotes to you, basically, that's what I'm putting into the soup. <laughs> And Christina. Um, so hello everyone again. 
I'm Christina. Um, I'm based in Malta. And I always like these these introductions because you are all, it's interesting to kind of listen to you. You are all, I'm here in the east of, or I'm here south of, and I'm just like, I'm in Malta. It doesn't really matter <laughs> the west, south, east, you know, like local, regional, and national are like so blurred into each other, just one. So I'm, I'm in Malta. <laughs> um, I just came from a workshop, an in-person workshop um, um, and by the way, it's 9 p.m. here, so um, it's been a long day. Um, I just came back from a workshop, uh, which was a bit of a visioning exercise about a concept which is kind of yet unknown. And we had discussions, should we define, not define, whatever. And I feel the need to embrace this moment of not knowing. And I think that is what I would add to the soup. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, yesterday morning I had my, my COVID, another COVID shot and then it didn't, I felt okay through the day and then today I feel so gross and then my computer wouldn't start and so, I, and I was late coming here. I'm like, what the hell? And I feel kind of like I'm really hungover and I'm not hungover. So I went through my computer and my gross COVID shot feelings in the soup, but also something healthy, like some kind of soup with turmeric or something healthy to get feeling better. But uh, yeah, my chopped up Athabasca University laptop can go in the soup <laughs> for sure. Um, so is that everyone? Did you go Jenny? Did you put, yeah, you put something in the soup. Good to be here. Excellent. We can churn them all up. Aviv. Yeah, maybe just to, uh, just to uh, start a little bit the conversation. It's, it's a bit an idea that we sort of been kind of bouncing around for, for the past two years in Liviana of actually um, all these, uh, these sessions that we had, they've, uh, they've all kind of like uh, created just a space where, where all these um, creative practices kind of like bounced against each other. And, um, and it, was, um, it was really uh, a great experience, I think, um, at least for me. Um, but, but I think there was uh, this idea of, of uh, somehow trying to, I don't know if distill is the right word, but somehow communicate outwards to the wider CERN uh, what it is about um, art practice that has a, um, kind of like an essential contribution, something like really important for community economies, theory and practice. And uh, um, I was thinking about that today I have a quote. I'm going to read you a quote. If you're okay, if I can read it, I found a torn up piece of paper and I have no light. Um, this is for from uh, a book called A Post-Capitalist Politics by um, J.K. Gibson Graham. Uh, it goes like this. Creativity is usually seen to involve bringing things together from different domains to spawn something new, a practice that has been variously called cross-structuring, and then there's like citations, Smith, 1973, cross-appropriation, Spinoza, Flores, and Dreyfus, 1997, and extension, Varela, 1992. Seldom are such techniques reflectively marshaled to the task of creating different economies that yet they constitute an important means of proliferating possibilities. This is, I don't think I've written anything academically where I haven't put this quote in so far. <laughs> but so I think there's like a, I think there's a call for creativity. Uh, I think there's like an openness um, that, that is saying there are creative practices. To me, this really resonates with practices of artists. Um, Specifically, I'm talking. I'm. I'm. I'm writing this thing right now. Juxtaposition 
encounter drift. These are practices, uh, kind of disoriented, reframing practices of artists. And I think um, to me, there's, so there's a potential here. And I don't think, um, I don't think it's fulfilled yet completely in the work that's being done. There's like traces of it here and there, but to come around and say like, actually this is really quite central in how we can do things differently in academia and in the ways we create community economies and the way things are organized. So, so there's that possibility that I think is very inspiring. And at the same time, I see an urgency. I think it's like some, there's something really uh, to me, it's not just something frivolous, something decorative, something fun, like a, a, an escape valve um, um, that kind of makes us feel better um, because it um, like kind of brings us away from the kind of overly serious, stressful ways of doing things. I think there's, uh, to me, to me, there's like not a way of creating uh, a different, um, different economies, a different world, without engaging with these kind of uh, practices. And I'm feeling that really a lot. Um, sorry about this diatribe. I swear it's not going to be so long, um, but I'm feeling it a lot recently because uh, in the past maybe year and a half, two years, I've been working here at the university on and off on research projects, a lot engaging with the local authorities and voluntary sector organizations, some of them large scale and universities themselves. And I, and I see like now, now I'm um, being employed on this project that has to do with climate resilience and net zero. So I'm reading all these policy documents about climate resilience and net zero. And I see how things are organized and I see things uh, in the kind of higher spheres of decision making, getting together for meeting after meeting after meeting, producing these enormous documents that I have to read. And they all say, like they repeat each other, they all say the same thing. These are urgent problems. We have to, you know, do something. Um, and, uh, and I see it just seems so wasteful to me that so many resources so much is invested in people who are de so detached from practice meeting together and producing these lengthy documents while uh, while there's just like n hardly any attention paid to the people on the front line actually doing the experiments that are actually going to produce change and there's not even they're not even looking there there's not embedded researchers in all these on the ground um you know, frontline uh, groups and organizations. And, and especially when you're working arts-based, I think, where you can really do some wild experiments, things that are really um, taking it as their premises, something so different than the way things are done. And so, so, these, so these experiments are so precarious and, and they just kind of like appear you know, they have a really hard time in surviving and then they kind of evaporate and no one's noticed. And to me, this is where uh, change is going to come from, if at all. And I feel like, and I'm going to finish my diatribe, I apologize. I feel like if this doesn't change, if we don't start paying attention to these kind of, kind of wilder frontline hands-on experiments that happen in small groups and neighborhoods and artists or art organizations and and I don't know wherever it is that people are um, trying something differently, then if these kinds of ways of doing don't manage to take root, which is really hard for them to do, uh, I think like I really connect it to what's happening now in where I'm from. I think just it's just going to come around and bite us in the ass in a really bad way. So to me, this is, this is urgent to articulate, to make visible. End of diatribe. Sorry. Thanks, Aviv. 
So I think the first question that we posed, like Aviv's, I think, raised loads of really good questions, was around like, what can the contribution be of arts and hands-on practices to kind of the always becomingness of community diverse economies? And I think that, I think you've sort of made loads of really good points about that, Aviv. And also, yeah, Justin. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know, I'm gonna, well, so you can hear me fine with the phone like this. There's no music interference. Okay, it's like some disco music in the background. Um, so I will just be so very specifically. Um, what my research turned into was not where I started. <clears throat> um, was questioning what the idea of studio experimentalism might be, um, because I'm in design, I'm in the arts, and they're obsessed with being labs. There's always lab, blah blah blah, and it's like even you know. Say that joint economics, like it kills me. Like joint economics, right? Probably one of the most like mainstream, like popular alternatives. They create the donut economics action lab. And I'm like looking at their because they do serious experimentation. I'm like, you're doing stuff on the street with people, like twining rope. Like that's not a, that's not what scientific labs aspire to be, actually. What we're talking about is studios. This is what studio pedagogy does. And so it led me down a path of looking at what studio pedagogy is as a signature pedagogy. Um, which is essentially exactly the quote that Aviv quoted, right? That is uh, a big feature of studio pedagogy. Um, <clears throat> and what does experimentation mean in studio, which is very poorly documented and difficult to document, but essentially it is about, it is experimenting creation. And so since I'm, I'm focused on, on commons making and commons design creation, um, you know, we don't, we can try and go down the experimental economics route of like experimenting with like interventions. But that's not actually what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to create approaches to, helping people be successful in creation, right? That's what you know, studios teach students. So anyway, so my um, my focus and a lot of my work in trying to uh, frame it is around what is studio experimentalism um, as an alternative and, you know, within the economics field. So instead of, you know, when we say, say experimental economics, we usually mean lab, but what does it mean to be studio experimental? Um, and, and also <clears throat> there are some challenges about how do we actually document that? How do we make that available to each other? How do we build on it? difficult because it's it's a different process but how do you know i could put up a website with you know various design methods i've used but that often like goes stale and is useless after a year so i don't have any answers to those but just that i think personally you know this idea of studio experimentalism as a way to advance kind of a the robust scientific empirical approach to you know people are always obsessed with is a way to kind of embrace um what makes art and and design uh useful and valuable to creating and developing these alternatives. Yeah, the idea that we're kind of often compelled to produce a model or a like thing, but it's actually something about the process and the experience and the experimentation that comes and yeah. And something something you said about um, how they go stale after a year. That's I mean that's like an observation about like I mean that's the kind of the kind of uh, granular observation that I need. I think we need to we need to apply onto processes to see um, what you know what you know what what are the things what are the kind of nuts and bolts of creating. Alternatives. So you observed that um, that uh, these um, uh, I don't remember what you said, but these practices that you, you use uh, they go stale after a year. So I mean, to me, that's that's like really that's really important, you know, because then you know that's uh, when you're learning from it. When other people are learning from it, they have to take that into account, you know, to not to not take on whatever it is that goes stale but you know maybe learn some sort of attitude that's more kind of like that kind of underpins it somehow I don't know specifically maybe you can give an example of something that goes stale and how it goes stale I just found that really interesting well so the the typical approach when we do these projects is um, we'll put up tools on the website um, usually it's a maybe a requirement of our funder but we also want our knowledge to resonate and be used by other people um, <clears throat> but one of the challenges I've in encountered is you know we put it up there but um, 
how could we want people to be able to use it and adapt it. Um, and then, like one of the projects and one of the papers we did very early on, like was based on this project called Leapfrog, where there are a bunch of the tools they'd adapted various design methods for like use for this librarian group trying to create a, well, <laughs> because their budget is being cut. Uh, I might, my PhD is in the UK. Uh, they had to like come up with ways to manage the library without money. Um, so um, <clears throat> with the best, best intentions, right? The tools are out there, but like they're in some PDF format and they try to make it editable and then, you know, someone has to maintain a website and then people can download it, but then how do they upload their adaptations? Cause you know, you're, you're now needing to create more of a wiki or some kind of WordPress site that allows people to like contribute back their adaptations, not just download it. Um, and without, as just able to tend to it and address the evolutions, then what you see now that's visible is like now three years, four years, 10 years old and it's useless. It's not capturing what's changing because we, you know, cause it, it is, a, there's a technology aspect. Um, uh, and that could be resolved. And there's also a governance aspect, right? And it was the comments part for me, which is like, we do need people like any comments to care for and tend, tend to this, uh, whatever this resource is going to be to keep it going. So, um, pretty much like, I feel like, I don't know how, I feel like we've all probably been involved in projects where we put up our reports or outputs or whatever. And like, they're super useless now. Um, even though we're like, no, no, I learned so much since then, but it's not captured anywhere because no one paid me to write the report afterwards. So like. Um, yeah, so um, so that was a, like ironically one of the projects we referenced in one of our, pa our papers. Like the, the website's like totally defunct now. Um, but yeah, it's so, like you know I think about this for all of my projects where I am. You know we're doing stuff and we're in a lot of the tools I've created and methods like they need work. <laughs> they were first attempts. They kind of failed and like that. But there was like something that was learned from them. I don't you know how do I make that available. Um, uh, but also, how do we allow people to capture learning and, and, uh, and to, to share it, which is a question we also raised, but at the same time, um, uh, yeah, I don't know, I'll go on, I'll see. Like, um, yeah, I, I mean, and then also as a, I don't know, as a side thing, since Jenny's here, and <laughs> like one of the things I learned, I really focus, I use the diverse economies action research framework to frame my action research. And so one of the lessons that came out of it that I found very different than was in that uh, chapter, um, one of the strategies is activating new language. And I actually found that very much not to be the case. Actually, what I sought to do is activate existing language. Um, most communities have ways of talking about the commons. And rather than trying to create words, and I stop talking about the commons, people. We just say, well, we're, you know, figure out what words people are using and just imbue those words with a, a new sense of meaning, which is, is, I know is kind of the spirit of that term. But I think when we say new language, we think about new language rather than saying, actually, we already have these words. How do we just activate the existing language that the people have? This was pretty poignant in Brazil um, where there's no word, right? Uh, so we were using um, the words people are using like cooperative, which is a much more fluent term um, than it is in the UK and US um, or mutulao, which is a kind of a local term for kind of making do, they have this in like, um, in lots of other words. Anyway, so, um, sorry, that was it. So that was like, there's a, there's a range of things like where I, I don't know how you share that. It's a very, very early days, but I, what I just noted in particular was it's okay in laboratory data, that stuff is static because it's like data captured at time, but studio by its nature is dynamic. And you have to find a way to figure out like how to, how to capture and build my dynamism, which is hard. Um, Justin's um, and Enavi both your talks. I'm trying to think of how to say this succinctly. Um, I I spent this morning. I went to. I'm on in my university. I'm on the um, union or the faculty union um, equity committee. So we talk a lot about equity, diversity, and inclusion. And really, um, we have we forefront a lot of work by indigenous scholars who we work with and as well as neurodiverse and scholars with disabilities and black and um, women of color scholars, we're looking at different equity seeking groups and how to really forefront and amplify alternative practices. And one of the things that's come up with our group, we're doing research around who does community engaged research and activist research and working with artists. And we're trying to embed like into our collective agreement. So working with our employer, um, pay for knowledge keepers, resident um, activists, artists, like really good pay and have that bed embedded. So you don't just go work with a community, but take really seriously how the work's going to be meaningful for the community. And then take really seriously in our 
our union culture and how we approach working with our employer and when we're looking at grants, um, how to get are the arts and arts funding and not like, yes, as an output, but as a way of research and take making theory making and have that kind of through, we want to weave it through so it becomes kind of naturalized and so it's something to take really seriously so that when we work with colleagues in different departments, let's say someone's in business or they're in science, like to really try to show that these different practices are taken seriously. So um, I work with a few people who, I love it. They're like, they go on to like the research committees and the ethics review committees. And like, we're seeing it as our responsibility to get on all these different committees to show activists and art space and research creation as, as a, the whole area of research creation as a artist's research that they work with are creating the research that they want to do. We're trying to get on all these committees so that it's becoming like naturalized, <laughs> like to take it really seriously as a form of research. And I do see like the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, the big Canadian research funder, you really do see research creation being taken more seriously. And there are bodies of funding for that. And it's because we're kind of whittling away and making sure that everyone takes t time getting onto these committees. And, but I, yeah, I, this frustrating thing was we were moving ahead with a really, I thought a really progressive, interesting crew in our union. And then our last election, a more kind of mainstream Marxist dude got in and his buddies and we're looked down on, like it's considered flaky, but we just keep, so I feel like we're like little bed bugs nibbling away and like chewing away at the mattress and trying to, but, but, how, but also like to identify where, where the policies are and how to get on them and how to, to have like, yeah. Cause I, my former life before I did this work, I did work in community arts in Toronto and we lost our spaces again and again. This was the, all the planners were talking about the creative city and the innovative city and the artist run centers couldn't stay open because of gentrification and because of funding cuts. And we kept appearing, people wanted artists around, but none of the artists could afford to live there. And 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 so watching that play out in, in that world and also just myself, I, I found it anxiety producing, living in Toronto, paying student loans and trying to write grants for my existence. So we're now in academia and thinking, where can I get in there to try to like, yeah, I want to pay people really good arts fees. If I do any project, I don't want to not pay somebody. So, but we're trying to make it, but that, but also the idea of the theory making, like to, not, not a cool output, but a theory making. It's a way of approaching these ideas and a way of being, doing our research. So yeah, just thinking of all, some of the more, I'm fine, yeah, but some of the more dry, institutional meetings, how to worm in there and keep chewing away like, and, and bringing these ideas and amplifying them. It seems to be our work. So I love meeting internationally and we can do this and then do it in our, wherever we're placed in terms of our organizations. I, I love the vision of the artist as a um, bed bug chewing away at the institution makes yeah. me think of the critic we had a lot of critters in the session last year anisa yeah i think i'm thinking a lot about institutional change and governance change in my work and governance as the aspect of governance that is in community economies and um that i think could be developed a lot more that question of governance, like governance of the commons, governance, uh, ethical negotiations in all the work that we're doing. Um, and that's what my PhD work is about. Some of you I think already know this, that I, um, I'm looking at the participation of social movements, peasant movements, indigenous people's movements, environmental organizations, people's organizations from across the world in international food and agriculture policy so talk about 
um, people repeating over and over again. We have such, there's so many problems. We need to do something. They've been saying it since the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization was founded in 1947. It's literally the same speech that's been happening for 75 years. So it's quite disheartening in some ways, but I think Heather, what you're talking about in terms of getting in there and actually it's a process of, uh, like Justin was saying, um, using the terms and activating the language and imbuing those with meaning or re-signifying certain terms like sustainability and innovation. It's being there and saying, no, we mean this by innovation. We mean this by sustainability. This is where it comes from according to these value systems. This is how we put it into practice actually being in that space and being able to expose people to a different way of feeling and thinking and seeing and understanding is sort of opens up and kind of brings life into um, a beautiful book called The Art of Being Many uh, that I'll show you in a second. And a, and a uh, an activist scholar, Pankstow Ramas, talks about bringing life into the institutional ecology you know, uh, recognizing that institutions, they're not these homogenous, completely totalitarian structures, but that there's all these cracks and, you know, uh, counterweights and countermeasures is what he talks about in his piece that's that's really lovely. Um, I'll find the book, here we go. <clears throat> this is a really fantastic book that's come out of like an artist collective, um, Hamburg based uh, and it's about assembling and gathering and uh, there's some let me see there's some pictures in here somewhere if I can find them oh yeah like there's a few kind of graphic representations but it's political theory and activist practice um, and it's about democratic assembling and how we do that but then there's the question of redistributing resources you know again it's not a new <laughs> problem that we have that we're facing you know the accrual of resources in the hands of a few and then how do we actually redistribute how do we you know what are the channels for us to first people have to want to do it they have to see a way of doing it you know and then and then and then you just give them a way of doing it you say hey do it like this it's really easy we've created a way for you to do it <laughs> and then you know so I think it's a lot of it is about thinking about how to inspire people and motivate them and then working in those very sticky and sometimes very difficult and frustrating and disheartening structural, you know, it's like when your body tissue is all knotted up, you know, and you get like crunchiness in the fascia and you've got to like, oh, you've got to stretch it and it really hurts. It's like, it doesn't want to go. It's like, no, I don't want to. And you have to kind of like work at it and work at it and work at it and go, come on, come on. We're just going to, okay, I'll, we'll let you rest for a little while. Okay, let's get back in there. So one of the examples is with agroecology, with global funding for agroecological uh, approaches to agriculture and agroecology, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, sort of thought of as a set of practices. It's like permaculture. You know, it's it's basically how people have been, you know, we've cultures all over the world. It's an approach that is working with nature rather than against it. Um, it's a science, it's a set of practices, but it's also a social movement. It's actually about our relationships with nature, different kinds of relationships with nature. So Funding for agroecology globally, I think, is something it's way less than even 5%. I think it's like 2% or 3%. There have been a bunch of studies that have come out in the last few years. So there's a lot of work being done in these really great organizations thinking about, okay, how do we redistribute, um, you know, research funding for agriculture into agroecology? And that's, I think, the question of, where is the money and where are those financial flows and how do we start to shift those <clears throat> in more fruitful directions so that we can support all of that frontline work on the ground, whether it's activism, art, scholarship, 
all all of the things that you know are connecting to make a different kind of infrastructure there's my contribution <laughs> over to you Oh. Okay, I, I did, uh, you can hear me? Okay, <laughs> I was just going to say, um, Heather, I think what you said is terrific. I just want you to, to say that um, I am not in academia, despite having three positions at universities. Um, so um, and I'm certainly happy to, if you want if you want to chat about it more or bring it up, I, I mean, it, it, it was part of actually my goal when I was coming here as a visiting scholar, because how do you create those connections? Because it's learning through practice and learning through doing, and you have to actually be doing to, to make those lessons. I don't have an answer. I wish I could tell you how to make that happen. But I also think it's maybe cynical or pragmatic, but um, you know, there's part of maybe, the, you know, unfortunately maybe the burden or responsibility for arts-based research or in design is to show how we do learn through doing. And so I hope to do, you know, my yet to be completely totally finished thesis. Um, is to show like we learned we you know by doing the commoning we learned information that contributes back to the common scholarship right even for those who are doing like way more staid like analytical work so like you don't have you have a different perspective so um and you know if we need to produce papers and data like we you know that's a thing right we can do with data and, and we can do papers and, and publishing so um i feel like my gut feeling is like you know that's what moves people is like the ability to produce uh you know uh ref in the UK or whatever, you know, uh, outputs and also to get in funding if there's funding available because you can show that you have the community networks, but also you're producing scientific research. I, I feel like one of the things that I've learned coming here is um, uh, people, I take it for granted, but people still don't really get the idea that action research or work or research with communities in designing and arts is research. They just, it's considered service learning is the term, service learning and translational research. And I was like, no, <laughs> it's, it's actual research. You just, you know, we put a methodology around it. We, we capture learning and it feeds back into, you know, into scholarship. So it may be that there's still quite a lot to go on showing people like the value of arts. Cause let's be honest, like it's, it's considered less valuable and less important, less truth, truthful than science. And we're going to have to be worse. Which is kind of why I was looking at studio experimentalism. Like how do we assert that value? Christina, what are you thinking about at the moment? I'm soon losing off, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, I'm just happy listening. Um, um, and um, it resonates so much. Um, and I'm reliving a bit some moments which I experienced um, I think it's like three weeks ago where um, over here in Malta, we had um, a conference and a symposium organized by, by the Arts Council of Malta. And uh, the conference was also in collaboration with the International Compendium of Cultural Policymakers. I'm not sure if it's the exact title, but it's something like that. It was about the right to culture, cultural rights and uh, during the first part of the, the conference part, actually, of this compendium, it was uh, um, full of cultural policymakers and uh, talking how we need to engage with artists, how these policies are being written, um, not by practitioners, how, how much we need to listen and um, I spent two days feeling very angry, leading to sadness, because there were no artists present in this two-day thing. So, um, and at the same time, when it was the moment that the artists could kind of share their projects, um, these cultural policymakers, international just flew back to their country and they did not follow the last part of like the last day. So, and I could see that coming from the very beginning. So, and um, it was the second symposium, the national second symposium that the Arts Council organized. And I was reliving the same moments, the same kind of emotions from last year. 
Um, and partially I was angry slash sad towards the organizers, towards the policymakers, towards the um, um, Arts Council, but also at fellow artists. Like, why are you not here? I mean, the very few that we were there, all of us were in a certain extent, to a certain extent involved in the sense that they were going to present something. I don't know if that was the reason why they were there or because they were really interested, but I was so saddened by it that like, okay. So I start since that, since for the past two weeks, I've been thinking a lot about relevance. So I think it was mentioned by, I don't know, it was Aviv or Justin, um, this question of relevance, how, how to make this arts-based approach is relevant, but not just to policymakers, but also to ourselves, to, to us fellow artists. I can't find an answer why fellow creatives aren't attending such events when we really need to work together to improve our own status of, as artists and so on. And in order to have these arts-based approaches not um, going stale, to quote kind of so that that's where I am at the moment and what kind of this conversation is uh, is kind of how it's resonating with me I think there's a real connection between what you experienced Christina and what's happening here in terms of the recognition of a disconnect between practicing artists in the art sector and then the policy and the funding and where and how those decisions are made and who decides what's a value um, and how our resources get distributed, who decides what's a value in terms of the arts practice that happens and the strategy and the policy. And I think there is a bit of a pushback like there has been um, sector organizing and sector advocacy. And I'm, we're starting to see a bit of the bed bugs eating away at the system um, and making a difference. And Elise, who isn't here, but Jenny knows, um, who's doing her PhD around a methodology for artists to produce their own cultural policy. Um, and then they're trying to, we talked yesterday at the Speculative Fiction Symposium about trying to use speculative fiction and with diverse economies to try and kind of radically reimagine possibilities for resourcing the arts to sort of and I think that for me connects to what I wanted to say about what I one of the things I think I think there's so many things that that the arts and arts processes and pedagogies and contribute into this space that aren't fully recognized but are um, I think we understand them whether that's tacitly through practice or even through the theory like I think it's all there it's but it's the classic thing of the arts just keep saying we're here and the value and it's we know and we know in these ways and then nobody really listens or recognizes because it because for whatever reason but what I wanted to get to was this idea of the imagination and the the imaginary and for me as someone who comes from like a theater and kind of storytelling story making through theater and other forms background it's that way of um arts practice working at the level of the imagination and the imaginary that I think is one of the things that the arts has got that's distinct that it can contribute into this space so where where Gibson Graham and Diverse Economy Thinking talks about the need for an expanded economic imaginary and how capitalocentrism is a is a kind of limited economic imaginary where we can only imagine capitalism um, when we come up with policy or strategy or institutions I think the arts have got a real role to play in challenging that because it can take, and partly because the the arts can do things which are very closely adjunct to our reality. And we talked about this in the speculative fiction session, I think, of sort of, we can see it's not so far from what we are now. Oh, this is what our life might be like if we suddenly had if more common commons and commoning. And we can, through fiction or the arts, we can sort of feel Kind of felt feel for that reality um but the arts can also take radical leaps of the imagination to take us to places that and that's why i think in for my my sense in terms of the policy and funding for the arts that's what we need is a bit of radical imagination um of like 
to pull us out of these kind of stuck places that policymakers keep kind of recycling and reproducing the labs and labs and labs and labs. And it's like the cultural policy and the policy and the creative cities and the da 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 that we keep making. Um, and yeah. And then so it's the imagination I've written down, it's the affect. So, and that's what Heather's really becoming such an expert in is this sense of how working with the body and the doing is working at that level of our kind of emotions and the affective into our tissues and as a both individually and as a society and I think there's something really important there of how, for how the arts work that the doing and the making and the being and how that works at the level of kind of affect and body and also imagination so yeah that's what I've got to say it's all a bit um esoteric rather than attached to anything concrete but yeah Heather I was just going, yeah. Oh, <laughs> so Jenny had her hand up there. Well, well, I mean, it just it you know what it makes me think about is, and I I love Molly how you you know you just sort of said there are these two really crucial roles that the arts can play, and I you know you've you've also said you're interested in working on a publication. So you know I wonder what a publication would look like that took a number of projects that community that people have used around diverse and community economies and and sort of did an analysis to say well here's here's the here's the leap of the imagination whether it's a small leap or whether it's a really radical leap in the imagination that's being generated by these projects and here's the effective impacts of these projects because sort of partly I wonder like if I wanted to know what 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 work community and diverse economies scholars are doing around the arts wh where would i find that like i'd have to know individual people who are doing work i think and look at their work so you know it seems that 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 um that you know one strategy for a publication might be to take three or four or five projects and then and sort of demonstrate the the common thread between them in terms of you know dimensions like the imagination or or impacts in terms of effect i mean partly to to help give a language to what is it that the arts is contributing I love Which, the and it's a sort of it's a classic, you know, community economies approach. Let's start with what we've got. What are the projects that people are doing? Let's 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 understand more about what is shared between those projects. And that sort of feels like that could be really doable. And it, you know, could be a great resource. Marvelous. Justin. So one thing um, I, I'm, I'm just putting out there was um, when I originally started my research, my focus was on economic imaginaries and how my work could change economic imaginaries. Because that was, you know, I, I originally, my background is economics and I lived on political economy, but my concern was like, well, we, we already have lots of theory and like we know stuff, like people just don't believe it. it's possible and they don't, they need to see it and feel and experience it to make it happen. So that's why I was moving into design and um the imaginary. Um, one of the challenges I faced, um, and so it was, <clears throat> okay, so if I'm doing a thesis, like, I have to like have a framework of analysis. Like how do I analyze the economic, people's economic imaginaries are changing? I don't really know like how you go about doing that. And the closest I found was one framework for spatial imaginaries, which is quite aligned. A lot of, you know, a lot of this work is rooted in geog like geography. So I tried to kind of um, adapt this um, spatial imaginaries uh, analysis. They were using things like, you know, um, whether you're looking at outputs and materials or words or various you know things, um, but then the second hand challenge is like I don't like how I don't know how to interview or ask people that question or how to or suss that out. Um, so I I mentioned like in the spirit of like knowing what's there um, is maybe other people do know how to do that I don't know um, but that you know we were talking about how these practices actually change you know how they're a part of changing that it's you know people think it's possible and what their sense of the economy is. I have no idea to know if I'm actually having an effect other than um, some of my colleagues have gone on to publish things, which clearly show that our work had an impact on them, which is terrific. Um, but it's not always so obvious like that. So I don't know, it's open. I may have missed it. My lit review may have been bad, but uh, so I'm open to better ideas. <laughs> Thank you. 
can I just um, elaborate something on what I just wrote in the chat? Because I was going to type it in, but like, no. <laughs> um, so that's just a link to a publication in reaction to the question, what impact can can the arts have? Which I think that publication kind of, um, to a certain extent, I think, tried doing. Um, I still need to look through it. I just have a chapter in it. That's why um, I have the link to it. But I would be interested. So I'm very much interested to have kind of something more specific to diverse community economies. Um, but I would be interested to have something more on a playful level, whatever kind of publication that is. Because, for example, this one is still very academic even though it's like all arts projects, it still very much has this academic approach and academic paper writing and whatnot. So I'm curious to see how this could lead to something a bit more playful, but still a useful resource uh, that academics can still make use of. <laughs> Christina, that's my frustration and struggle too, because I feel like my research and the people I work with is quite playful and bizarre. And then I can think of the academics who are out there hoping that they'll get it for peer review. Um, but I don't, I often get kind of this, there's um the same kind of people, I think, I don't know who they are, I'm assuming, but it's the same kind of peer review and the same kind of network of people I'm supposed to cite. And, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and there's like, um, yeah, so I kind of, I was talking to a friend about it a few weeks ago, and she's like, yeah, that's kind of what you signed up for. Like, I feel like it's kind of part of the job. I just sent something <laughs> you can turn into a gray pellet turd thing that will <laughs> count or whatever. But there are more and more, for me, like the really, um, the, this really critical, like ra the, the critical art stuff that I'm really feeling an affinity with is coming out of disability studies and radical black feminist work and indigenous work. And I, 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 I'm trying to, yeah, like it's really anti-colonial. So, uh, so I, I'm just trying to figure out who's reading the stuff and how, um, like for example, um, the black feminist geographer, Catherine McKittrick writes around, um, like speculative fiction and and funk music scenes in Detroit and like it starts with very poetic and there's some really powerful and I work with people who produce work in spoken word poetry and political science like there is really radical stuff so I would love I'd love this book this idea that Jenny has is great and I love the idea of keeping the playful and the surreal and the weird and, and the spirit also like Donna Haraway's book around putting the little backpacks on pigeons or like keeping that surreal <laughs> and forefronted but it's frustrating sending yeah sending stuff to journals you don't know who's getting this stuff and th there seems to be a dominant type of research that's valued and you get it in the reviews but the other times you can see it's gone to critical radical stuff where the imagination pops so how to yeah how to keep that going but I do I feel um I really yeah everyone I've complained about this but I really struggled in my postdocs in, in Glasgow I found the rat the research excellence framework and the impact agenda that stuff very rigid and I found it very um frustrating and now I'm trying to divest from that and, and figure out how to do that get the art out there like it just yeah you can feel like it's kind of rendered down so on one hand, I'm like, okay, this is bed bug, keep chewing and working on this. On the other hand, damn, this is annoying. Like, so like, <laughs> so anyways, but it'd be great, wonderful to have like some strange cookbook or something that has <laughs> these possibilities and, and techniques. And um, that would be wonderful. And point to what we're, people all around us are doing this work in our network. And, and I love starting like that spirit of starting with what we have, it's already bubbling away in our network. So really amplifying that. Mm -hmm. And there's a baby. And Christina, that book is um, published by Routledge, but is yeah. fully downloadable, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's, you can that's, download um, it or, yeah. Yeah, the whole book, which is, yeah, 
really, really fantastic to see a mainstream publisher doing that. And I mean, more and more publishers are making these things available um, to, you know, online. That's great. One of the things that we're trying to do here, sorry, Anissa, which is a sort of tangentially attached to this idea of impact and metrics and what gets valued is um, we're, we're um, proposing and trying to get a proposal accepted for an open access book that's giving, that's taking um, ac both academics and pra arts practitioners um, who are working on the ground to share alternative ways of sort of evaluating. So articulating and deciding on the value of their work around particularly well-being in this instance um, to try and challenge some of the sort of dominant frameworks and really trying to challenge actually the discourse of, of impact and social impact um, and by looking at the frameworks that have been developed by really amazing arts practitioners and organizations themselves to self-determine the value of the work with their participants and articulate that in, in really amazing ways. Um, yes, so I think, but it's it's a real challenge because whenever we kind of put this proposal forward, the, the kind of hammer or the, the mallet of the social impact framework sort of comes back down and it's like, you can't possibly have a alternative you have to show the impact in this way or you have to um yeah it's sort of this disbelief that it that could possibly be an alternative anyway I'm really determined we're going to get it through and my faculty is going to fund it um but <laughs> um it's it doesn't exist yet but I, I think this idea of really putting forward the possibilities that have come out of the practice themselves um yeah, and inventing kind of lively frameworks. I really liked the idea, Heather, that you talked about of the bingo card. For example, like these sort of more things that sort of are a more playful way of kind of articulating and exploring things. Anyway, I've, someone else and had something to say. Heather, uh, Aviv, we can't hear you now. Anissa had her hand up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look, I I'm, was kind of, had a question about the impact the specter of impact <laughs> a little bit that Molly I think you just you just talked about a little bit and the thing the note that I put in the chat or the question what impact can the arts have it was like a playful possible title for a paper um, where you could un unravel that idea of impact which I know is being done in community economies um, work with the CROI uh, I don't know enough about the community economies return and investment framework to know if arts are, or you know, if if that could be useful for for arts based practice, or if there needs to be another kind of one developed. And that, if that's what you're talking about, Molly, I don't know enough about it. But yeah, I'm just curious as to how to advance that, <laughs> you know, un unraveling that whole, you know, those impact frameworks that are imposed on us and coming up with their own own kinds of ones in a in a playful way Christina <laughs> yeah there's more just a question about that for everyone and if that would be like a useful I mean in terms of the book that Jenny sort of put forward I mean that that was about like what impacts can the arts have and 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 how do you then how do you um present that you know what framework would you use to present that and I think that question of that that Justin asked that I don't have an amazing answer to, but it's such a good question of how do you how do you show if you've shifted someone's economic imaginary? Like, what an amazing question to consider and explore. I just think that's and and I'd be like, oh, well, you're going to have to get them to make some art, but that's not always going to be possible. <laughs> yeah, Justin. I was like, and Aviv, did you want to speak before I speak? Because I feel like you were trying to speak and then you were, you can hear you. I keep, uh, I don't have the capacity to raise my hands here for some reason. It's like, uh, they told me to download it, but go ahead and I'll go afterwards. I just, I wanted to respond to several strands that kind of were yeah. going on a bit earlier. So, so um, what I just wanted to say uh, off of what Anissa said is, so I, I have this 
I, my background is in is in impact measurement, and I was involved in developing of SRY twenty years ago, and uh, at NEF, and the, the the local multiplier tool was my claim to fame, um, which is uh, still you say which shocks me. But one of the challenges I find from that, and why I'm interested in the imaginary, is <clears throat> when we get into the ROI, there's a value to that, but you're playing someone else's game, and you are having to get into what, you know, return. I, I'm all for, like, I do those things as part of it, like, I'm trying to shift the local government, like, okay, because I really believe no one's ever done this, like, maybe we can show that if you buy your goods and services through commons instead of, like, you know, the business, like, it's actually going to be more cost-effective. We don't know because no one ever gives them a chance, but, like, that is a question I would I would definitely, I know I need, would need to answer to convince people. At the same time, we have to actually get people to ask about value in a different way, which isn't unfortunately usually about monetizing in any way because we will always lose that battle. Um, so this is where, you know, how do you speak to the people who do get this idea of like, okay, there are all these alternatives and hey, we have ways of actually knowing that we're shifting this imaginary. So it's a, it's a really, it's maybe a little esoteric and a little out there, but like that was just kind of my life experience of like, I. We can still play the game and like answer the questions, but like I want to speak to the people who care about these, you know, who get the imaginary, and we'll just we can form a solidarity together and measure things differently. And it, it is, it is a completely different set of terms. Can 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 I just clarify something in terms of just the idea that I was tossing out there? Was was um I was I was just thinking something more like a you know like a paper. And not even, you know, a paper through a referee journal, but just and just something that sort of, you know, is more descriptive of what people are doing. And, you know, because, you know, getting into the whole impact thing is just, I mean, I think, as Justin said, you end up playing someone else's game. And I think I, you know, I just think I, I think it's just important to put out there what people are already doing. And, and I think I think people sort of get the impact in a way. Um, so, so, you know, so I was sort of trying to suggest something just light as a first step. Yeah. <laughs> I also think, yeah. and Aviv, I'm going to pass to you after this, but I just wanted to say, like, I do think there's, we should have some sort of studio session or I was going to say laboratory and now I can't say oh, laboratory, yeah. um, where we, yeah. um, yeah. think about the CEROI, the community economy's return on investment, because so, um, Kelly and Graydon, what they did with the life and vacant spaces group here, um, using and adapting the Ceroi to um, kind of capture non-individual contributions to work, contributions to non-individual well-being, community ecological well-being, and so on. Like not specific to the arts, and I think they admit that they didn't kind of really get into it because there's a lot of arts projects part of this bigger project. And they didn't really get into what it was. And I so I think there's something to, to do in that space, which is I think there's potential in the Ceroi, but it needs kind of putting through that studio pedagogy to kind of think about how that would work in the context of the arts. Um so it's a bit more of a producing a model that could potentially go stale process. But anyway, I'd love to have have a go with that. And there's I think there's a one project line of flight there as well. Aviv. Uh, just to take back to, can you hear me? Yeah, just to go back to, uh, uh, I have like uh, three things to say, going back to two kind of strands of the conversations that are going on before. Um, one was about this idea that uh, one of the contributions art practice and arts thinking can make to community economies is this idea of expanding the imaginary, um, helping us imagine um, other kinds of possibilities. Um, and the other strand, and this is kind of going to go both be responded to in a similar, by a similar kind of direction, is this idea, this, this focus on redistributing resources from institutions, being in institutions, redistributing resources. And for me, I think there's like, there's other things that could be going on here, because there's other, excuse me, uh, there's other uh, arts traditions that also can expand the imagination, but also can do something even slightly more than that. I'm talking about sculptural traditions. 
So in a sculptural tradition, you actually create something that's in physical space that people have to contend with. People sometimes have to go around, around or through or move. Um, so the idea of creating something, experimenting with the, with the real thing, not with a representation of the thing. So then there's like a tradition of, you know, and there's some people in CERN who are kind of playing around with that, actually creating, um, using arts thinking to create, actually create businesses. Crying is not allowed. Um, so I think, I think there's that, that, um, needs to be thought about also i think it's an it's an interesting route to explore it expands excuse me um it expands uh our imagination but it also has a kind of like a materiality excuse me tough crowd um it gives it gives this imagination a weight and a credibility that just an, an image or or a text or just an imagination of what things could be, you know, you could be like, yeah, you know, you can be, you can write speculative fiction, but actually to have an experience uh, in in social space, it has a different kind of weight to it, and it, because people people doing it actually take, uh, you know, they 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 make an investment and they take a risk. And they pay a price also, like like people do when they create, uh, you know, livelihoods, economies, and businesses from them for themselves. Um, so I think that's an interesting line, and the kind of maybe representatives of this line. Okay, okay. Stop it. Um, less of them are here today to talk about it. And then the other thing about, and, and similarly, the idea of redistributing resources from institutional spaces. I'm there, I'm now in the university, you know, trying to redistribute something towards things that I think are valuable. Uh, but I'm always, something in my mind is always saying, am I sentencing myself to 20 years of boredom for trying to change the system from within? You know, is this, does it make more sense to go and take the risks and create something grassroots and, and try and, and, and make that flourish? And, uh, merci. No, no, he doesn't like what I'm saying. Um, so, I mean, I think both are valuable and I'm, and I'm definitely exploring the institutional route right now myself. Uh, but I'm always doubting uh, and saying, like, am I wasting my time? You know, should shouldn't I be, you know, starting a flower shop or a falafel stand, and you know, creating social change through there? And uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a scary thing to do, but uh, but something about it, I think, uh, because of the risks that you take uh, brings on some, I'm, I think some real learnings. Uh, so, and then in terms of uh, publication, uh, I had this thought that maybe, uh, because this conversation is really interesting and it has so many different strands of, of things we could be writing about and, and, uh, and, and learnings that we could be having and telling the kind of the wider CERN uh, but I don't think that this conversation transcribed would necessarily make for for a very uh, legible text, like just as it is. But what about the project of um, of us or whoever's interested interested um, trying to find out whoever it is that wants to talk about these things that has something interesting to say and wants to express it, and we can kind of divide this up between us and have one-on-one -on -one conversations and transcribe those where people can go in depth in terms of what they're thinking and their practice and, you know, and what they're learning and how that's maybe different. And then each one of these conversations can be uh, a chapter of a, of a publication. And then we can have all these different practitioners and thinkers that we 
just have around us in CERN um, have kind of more space, each one to express themselves in front of someone who's interested and they can also respond and maybe bring from their experience. I don't know, that just come, something that came to mind. I think there's something in terms of um, from this conversation, the themes, like the strands, like you said, to kind of pull out. And then I think I like Jenny's suggestion of starting relatively small with three or four people who might then talk about their work. And it might be start in relation to those strands from this conversation and then see where that goes. I will say that the other thing that I feel is a challenge, just to go back to the kind of theme of the session around kind of curiosities and quandaries, I think one of the challenges we've had, because we kind of, as a group, and Justin, you might you know, we've, the, some, of, some of us have been meeting for kind of a while and have talked variously about publications. And one of the quandaries I have, I think, around that is, is the distribution of resources and how that has kind of, stopped quite a lot of possibilities from turning into something because of the different differential ways in which the people in the wider conversation are resourced and differential capacity that people have to and the differential inclinations that people have to contribute to something which might seem academic and not the falafel shop you know it's like um yeah so that's a quandary I have and I don't have a solution to it but I feel like every we've kind of built up towards the doing of something and then that's become a kind of barrier that we've never solved because we've never been able to get the fun like funding or resource to sort that out. Aviv, I like the this conversation idea too, like, um, but then yeah, Molly makes a good point for the time. <laughs> And who's like paying people to take part in this conversation. But I, I also like the idea of the deep dive and three or four little groups showing like that example of people that are using their art to start businesses or do interventions. Other people, the thinking of art at the institution governance level. Like I love the idea of you know, different ways people are negotiating these things. And the, I think that would be really neat that the conversations can really pull down but yeah again um the differential access to resources and time and who would do that and how to but I guess that's also all of that to amplify all that that's all the solidarity and the coalitional work of this and being really honest about how uneven this is and really facing that too as part of the discussion so that would be built into the publication like how it's so uneven and we're always going to be facing all, all those quandaries, but then how to learn from them and work with them. But, but I just think that would be, I would love to see a conversation like Kate Rich's work and Anissa's poetry or like just all like just what, where we're all at and what we're doing and how it's playing out. Cause there's so many different practices going on here. Great idea. I mean, sorry to bring it back to a very practical question, <laughs> but I'm, I mean, it seems like there could be several goals or hopes or however we want to frame that. Like, what is it that, I mean, I feel like I'm a bit of an interloper in a way, like, am I an artist? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. I did a little doodle <laughs> of our conversation, <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, like in one way, I think Molly's idea about exploring the Seroy and what what that could mean or how it could be developed for arts-based practice, that could be a kind of more practical way to support changing the way that arts are perceived that maybe could help with funding. I mean, this is a like what we're all doing is a very long-term, you know, it's like a lifetime work. So thinking about it is like, well, what's the next step? And what's the next step we feel inspired to take? And what's the next step we feel we have energy for? 
because sometimes it can all feel a bit too much. Um, could it be nice to have some conversations that would just be recorded? Maybe there's somebody that could be paid to clean them up and they could go on to the uh, community, the CERN website as, as just a resource, as something for people to read. Like, does it need to be a publication or something? Could we just start to do these things in small, small ways with the capacities that we have? But also thinking about, like, is there a a longer term goal that we would like to work towards in those small steps. And then of course it's, well, do we want to try to apply for money for something? And that's a bigger piece of work that would require, you know, a conversation about who has the capacity and, and inclination to do, to do that. So I think it's, a, yeah, I'm curious as to, yeah, what some of the goals are, what people's capacities are um, and what the next steps might be. This is not, this is just a joke, but I went and saw this amazing improv PowerPoint and people just had to turn around and start giving a talk based on these images. <laughs> so you can come knowing what you want to talk about, but you have to follow some images of someone else's rando PowerPoint of pictures of bears and plums and, but no, <laughs> but that would, <laughs> don't do that. But I was just thinking something. So I love the idea of, I, uh, videos or recordings but don't do that but it just looked amazing people had to improvise very serious discussions about other people's powerpoint images <laughs> i think i think it's a good point um anisa about uh doing what's you know what doesn't take a lot of resources and i think the i think uh it was always about things growing organically from there. So if we can have a series of conversation, whether they be in a small group or one-on-one -on -one, uh, that we kind of decide between us, um, and then these are transcribed, um, and they could be also, you know, yeah, maybe that's good, just putting putting them up on the on the community economy's website and and seeing, you know, if we feel like they compel us to publish them further in some more formal way. We'll see when that happens. We'll see when we'll see based on the on the on the thing itself. You know, I think it'll it'll somehow publish itself, you know, by you know, motivating us to to do it if that is the thing to do. But right now we need to just follow our curiosity and see like do this kind of conversational uh mapping where people get a chance to express these different ways that they answer these questions that we set out for this session, basically. Um, in terms of the, the strand, my personal interest, and I don't think this should in, be like the, the general question, but I'm always interested in what, what from arts practice, what can contribute to the, the real like nuts and bolts of surviving well together and of you know creating uh, different kinds of livelihoods that take root um, like beyond institutions, beyond um, centralized um, power structures and economies. Uh, so, cause I'm always, you know, trying and failing and creating these kinds of projects. And I'm just like, well, so what, you know how does it how could it actually how could it actually work and what what practitioners are out there that are that can that can uh, teach me about things um, taking root and creating grassroots alternative to alternatives to you know to these huge institutional ships that I see are so hard to uh, to turn around. Um, I'm saying this because I'm now in the past, like I said, in the past year and a half, two years, I've been uh, I've been doing research work here at the university, on and off, part time, and a lot of it is about people um, talking about systems change and people about talking about um, the flipped university model, which means putting the university's resources at the service of the community, and uh, and I see with all the best intentions how hard that is to do and and how people who are embedded in a system think that the system changing 
is social change. We're actually just like, to me, just like the system needs to be just like contained, held back. So it allows for space for other ways of thinking that are asystemic sometimes, uh, which is where, to me, where I imagine social change emerging. So I don't think, so I think these people are, um, embedded in in systems like say in, in universities, and and so, some of them cannot see outside of these structures, and they think that if this structure of power will change, uh, then there will be change. But I'm, I I see how uh, how they just they just get tangled up in forms and and proposals and bureaucracies and uh, just in just in trying to, to do it. And it's just like, mm, uh, I don't know. It's just even trying to do that ends up being so wasteful sometimes. That's my my perception. Um, so, I mean, all power to them. You know, I love all these people I'm talking about. I think they're really well-intentioned and very radical thinkers from within institutions, more imaginative than most of other people there. Um, but still, then I see, I see people, my friends who are like in the neighborhoods doing stuff and they're just like, what are you even talking about? You know, you know, and then, they, you know, we produced this document inviting, the, you know, people from the community and we said, we're going to do this project. We're not going to reinvent the wheel. And the, the housing organization I work with in the neighborhood, the guy re read it and said, like, when I read, we're not going to re reinvent the wheel the wheel I reached for my revolver. That's what he said. He said, you just reinvented the wheel. You know, after all these people talking and talking and talking and hoping about uh, the university changing and flipping and being at the service of a community. Um, so so I'm like kind of straddling both perspective, but I, I definitely see his point. Now, I'm aware that we're coming towards the end of the session. It's been a long time talking. Um, Aviv and Heather as co-conveners, is there anything else that you want to, yeah, and I think bio breaks, but I'm thinking we actually may finish just a little bit early rather than having a bio break and coming back for 10 minutes. Well, that will let Anita go. She's gone. But is there anything else, Aviv and Heather, that you think we need to sort of cover in terms of the questions or conversation, any threads that need tying up? For me, no. I think it, I think it's been a good conversation. And I think, uh, to me, what came out of it is that there needs to be some sort of follow-up where we decide, you know, like the ideas that came here about how to make this concrete, how to communicate, what, how do we define a project that, you know, ha, you know, has conversations that we need to have these conversations, uh, maybe between, between whoever here who is interested in, in participating in something like that. So maybe some, we can do some follow up emails and, and see what we can do um, moving on. I love the idea that there might be a series of kind of interviews that go on the CERN website. I feel a Flourish Fund application coming on for next year, potentially around that. So um, maybe just to finish, um, everybody could just, oh, Heather, is there anything else that you want to cover? Well, oh, as I was thinking of what Aviv's idea, also um, interviews or discussions, putting them on a post. And then I was hoping maybe to send them far and wide people if people knew of actual projects to put on a blog or they could like kind of using it to try to capture and see if people can send in stuff they know about um to respond to our writings i don't know but that, I, mean, I like the idea of i'm starting where we are looking at all the interesting things that are go people can talk about what they're doing in our network and then hopefully other we can hear about other things happening in other places or examples it's like there must be all kinds of different little examples here and there. And also outside of the North American European context, like when I went to this residency in Oaxaca City a couple of years ago, there was such radical art practice happening around gentrification, teachers unions. Like, I don't know. 
how much in universities are outside, but there was a whole Latinx kind of pluriverse of really awesome projects happening that Colombian and Mexican students brought. And they'd love to know what's happening in other parts of the world. So, because these institutions where they're being challenged all the time. So like somewhere like Chile or like, I'd love to know what's going on. So, yeah, that's all. <laughs> so maybe just to finish, if people are willing to just go around and maybe share one doodle or note or curiosity that has been, that you've generated over the course of the session. Is there anyone who'd be happy to go first? Anissa, you've got a small hand going up. Well, look, I just love the session and I just love the idea of Athena, the archival goddess. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'll take a photo of this and share it if you guys want. Yeah. Just a few, just a few doodles from the session. Just, it was lovely to be with everyone and listen to the conversation and participate. So thanks. Thanks, Anita. Anybody else? Doodle, curiosity, note, Jenny. Uh, I, well, I've, I've just got my notes, but I the the note I've got at the top on oh, it's hopeless, isn't it? Trying to do that uh, is the uh, the book that I think Anissa you mentioned about the art of being many. So I mm. thought, oh, that looks super interesting. So thank you for that, and thank you everyone. It's been fantastic to sort of just feel like I've been listening in on the conversation. Thank mm. you, and I'm really happy to you know figure out how things can go on the website too. So. That's, yep, happy to do that. From my end, I, I, I liked how the previous workshop I was participating in in person moved very smoothly into this session because there was this idea of speculative fiction that we were discussing. So I think that is my main uh, comment thing for tonight. <laughs> Thanks, Christina. Um, <clears throat> I was gonna say that uh, it's quite rare to have a gathering of people who are at the intersection of art in the widest sense and community economies so you know in my my design department i was like the lone person doing commons and now I, i'm a commoners the lone designer and here i get to be around people who actually are in both so um i really value uh just connecting with people and it reinforces ideas i have and then gives you new ideas and you know the reality is it's all percolating and i don't you know i had no expectations that anything was going to come out of this other than like oh it's nice to talk to people about it so i'm really happy about that it was really invigorating um and I'm always happy to chat with people more. And uh, as you can <laughs> could imagine, I would say, we could use a studio process for how we actually support each other to, uh, to make in our various respective places. I don't have no answer for how that actually looks, but we all are experts in doing it. So um, anyway, so thank you for organizing. Um, I think the fact is this is, is already happy for me. Um, and you, know, you guys have been meeting more regularly. So for me, it's new, but uh, I'm happy to join that more regular meeting and, and talk to people and um, so yeah. And I, I just wanted to share, I've been doing some strange found poetic notes throughout the session. Um, and I'm just gonna share one of my favorite bits, which is from when Anissa was talking. It's in the chat. Ah. Hmm. Makes me think about the painful spiciness that you put in the soup, Aviv. Uh -huh. got mixed in I keep thinking of this we're like this weird plum tree that's growing into someone else's yard and then the plum tree gets removed but then these little mini plum trees and then some of them end up over in Salt Spring Island so we're trying to grow little pirate plums in the in the in, in, in our writing just dropping these seeds and then someone's like look at that then they take it over to a whole other island so that's our job is just to keep seeding and rooting different things and shifting and 
getting frustrated, getting attacked by a bear or a wiener dog and then growing. And, but, um, but I like, uh, yeah, like I mean, frustrated and thinking about this stuff for like 15 years now. Like it's, so it's just good to keep, keep tackling it. Like my, in my story, I felt like as a, in the arts, it was frustrating finding funding and then in planning, not being taken seriously. And then academia, it was like Marxist radical dudes. So my thing was just create a man, put a mustache on and make mock videos is my way to survive. But like, how do we like, yeah, work within and against and, and take, do playful things, but also serious things and discuss and post. Like, I like this idea of all these different registers we're working with and um, seeing the limitations of institutions. But like, I like the idea of the pirate plums and the creatures. <laughs> so, so thank you for your time and all your, your input. I didn't. I didn't do any doodle worth uh, worth showing. Just imagine I'm lifting because I don't have them anymore to the screen. And recently washed naked baby. That's uh, all I have to offer right now. Uh, yeah. Thank you all for for I I love the conversation. I think it is very rich. Um, and uh, so many so many things to follow up on. I think uh, it's just for me, it was just like a lot of uh, still just like a lot of like kind of uh, like Justin said, percolating potential um, in this conversation. That'd be great to uh, to kind of materialize in some way that makes visible to uh, to more people in CERN and, and even further out. Wonderful. Thank you. So I'm going to draw us to a close. Um, just a reminder, if you do have anything that comes up for you afterwards, you want to contribute to the Liviana archive, please send them to Heather. And uh, But otherwise, yeah, please just everybody, let's stay in touch. Let's keep conversations going and we'll follow up on some of the various ideas and lines of thought and action that have come out of the session. But thanks for coming and being part of the conversation and just being generally amazing. Thank you. Thank you all. Really nice to see everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Oh, Good night. Hey, oh, I was say, Aviv, I'll be in a, I'm coming to Sheffield in January for the, not, not, I'm going to, sorry, not, yeah, Sheffield. Vaguely close to Hull for the D Digital Good Network. We have a showcase. Um, so. Yeah, drop me a line. We can always, I will send you a thing. So uh, we're doing, we're doing, the, this is where it's arts, it's design research for ESRC. So it's about how, and so it's been my first, our first experiment, I actually doing studio experimentalism into economics and social science. So uh, anyway, so I was cool. like, oh, I should tell you this. But yeah, I have no yeah. plans to be in Australia, New Zealand, unfortunately, much, I, much as I would like to. <laughs> yeah. um, so anyway, cool. All right. Awesome. Lovely to meet you. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye. Have fun.